You are listening to The Emulsion Podcast, a show that informs and inspires the restaurant industry to work, live, and create better. My name is Justin Kana. I'm a chef and media producer with almost 10 years of experience in award-winning restaurants all over the world. I created this show as a way to give back, to inspire the next generation, and help you progress your career. The Emulsion Podcast is sponsored by you folks, and Patreon is where that happens. If you're here as a return listener and enjoy the episode you just came from and happen to want to support more episodes, visit patreon.com slash Justin Kana. I'd really appreciate it if you can. I totally understand if you can't. Free ways you can support this show include leaving a like or comment on this episode, filling up all five stars on iTunes so more people can find us, or simply sharing an episode with a friend. This is a solo episode. That's right, it's just you and me. I'll be dishing up a curated list of articles, happenings, and headlines that I've been paying attention to over the past few days, and then season them with my perspective and opinion on these industry stories. If you want to go deeper, full show notes are available on justinkana.com slash podcast podcast. If you come across a story you'd like me to talk about, shoot it to me on Twitter and hashtag The Emulsion so I can find it. Let's get ready to welcome your host for this episode, Justin Kana. What's up, folks? My name is Justin Kana. This is episode 78 of The Emulsion Podcast. I wanted to start with someone that just messaged me on Instagram telling me that the fact that Flynn McGarry's brownies were didn't spend enough time in the oven is apparently a reference to his age, which I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about, like, I went straight to chef brain, like, he's critiquing the brownies, but apparently Flynn McGarry doesn't serve brownies, which also makes sense, because he doesn't bring them up as part of one of the desserts that he had, so I just thought that was kind of fascinating, and also partially hilarious that, you know, I didn't get that reference, but the person who gave me the heads up was, um, the sweet something, uh, so it totally makes sense that they got that reference, and I did not, but that was just a quickie update. Uh, Here's the heads up of what's going to happen in this episode. This is your rough outline. First off, we're going to do our rapid fire headlines like we've been doing. Then a quickie update, because especially if you're watching on video, you're probably like, where is Justin right now? And then we will dive into the main stories, which include a mini doc about a Michelin starred chef traveling to Mexico, a huge controversy in China about salmon and trout, a new rumination from Bonjuing Lee about killing meritocracy, why David Chang matters, and so much more coming up. But for now, here's your headlines. Netflix announced a new show focused on competition. It is called The Final Table, starring Bon Appetit's editor Andrew Knowlton as the host. And the gist of it is 12 teams of two chefs will quote-unquote cook the national dishes of Brazil, England, France, India, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Spain, and the U.S. The lineup of countries does lean heavily toward Western Europe. There's nowhere in Africa, the Caribbean, or Central Asia represented. Every episode will focus on a different country with celebrities, food critics, and the individual deemed the country's greatest chef judging the hopefuls, end quote. Who are the chefs, you ask? Names like Grant Ackett's, Anne-Sophie Peek, Helena Rizzo, Yoshihiro Narisawa, uh, Enrique Oliveira, Andoni Aduriz, and more are part of the roster. So, you know, just add that list. Add that to the list of food shows that you need to watch this fall coming up on Netflix. Frenchette in New York is under fire for their decision of steak knife aesthetic, particularly their decision to use knives made by French knife maker Roland Lanier, who I'm a huge fan of, by the way. I've been following him for a long time. He is just a really down-to-earth guy and makes really dope with a bunch of different varying um, handle types, depending on the restaurant. But his knives are designed in a way where the blade is the flat part and the curved part is the spine, if that makes sense if you're listening over audio. I have a little visual up for everybody here, which is apparently very confusing. Pete Wells saying in his review, quote, at French Chet, they they overlook the peculiar steak knife brought out with the duck. Its sharp side is straight, but its dull side is curved, and everybody who picks one up makes a joke about slicing open a finger. That would be one way to turn tables faster, but I never saw any casualties end quote. But what confuses me, though, is like the design is very intentional. With a sharp steak knife, you won't tear the meat of whatever you're cutting, resulting in a tastier bite. So one of the French Frenchette owners saying, quote, but it's a knife for crying out loud. If we're getting tripped up by one of man's first tools, we've got bigger societal problems to contend with. End quote. Eater published its list of young guns for 2018, the best and brightest of the restaurant industry. The list is linked up down below. Huge props to everyone that's featured. If you want to know how to get in, quote, the contenders must be under the age of 30 or have fewer than five years experience in the bar and restaurant world. And they're dedicated to their craft and doing so well that we'll expect they'll soon be household names, end quote. 
Shout out to Niels Brisbane and Shota Nakajima right here in Seattle for being featured on the list. Always eager to see who's making moves in the industry all over the country, especially at such a young age. CNN is on track to produce a documentary about the late Anthony Bourdain. It will be feature length. That means it's going to be like a big screen premiere. You can go see it in the theaters. It's going to be fascinating to see what kind of direction they take it in. Of course, he was such a figure, and it's incredibly sad that he he took his own life, but there's so much content out about him. He was being filmed a lot, uh, especially, you know, towards the end of his life, but we'll see how much of the highlight reel that they show and how dark they make it and who they interview for it. I know Dr. Documentaries uh, can sometimes get shaped by who's telling the stories about the person, Uh, but I'm definitely eager to learn more and, of course, course watch it when it comes out. That's enough headlines. Today's beverage, I made myself a little, I don't know what you would call this, if it's technically a latte because it's cold brew with milk. I guess it's just called cold brew with milk. Someone can uh, check, check my coffee knowledge there. You don't have to go to bed, dude. You can keep watching the podcast. That goes out to uh, Rubber Toe 4 on Instagram. So sit back, relax. The real show starts right after I gave a shout out to Emmanuel C. and Pixel Grease, both brand new supporters of this show on Patreon. Always happy to show you folks some love. It truly, truly means the world that you support my content. Um, it helps keep this show, unlike some of the other podcasts that will give you a three to eight minute ad read at the start of the show. So thank you. Thank you so much. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go ahead and check out patreon.com slash Justin Kana. It keeps my content sustainable AF as well. We are actually about three weeks away from the cutoff for the quarter four gearbox, which is October 1st. That's the cutoff. Um, If you do sign up to the mentor TR and Patreon, you get that gearbox uh, that I will ship out um, first week of October. So that's in addition to the monthly coaching call. That's part of that tier. And the tiers on Patreon have finally gone through their full revamp. So the new levels are $1 makes you a supporter. That's what I named that tier. I know it doesn't feel like a lot, but it is. And I'm super, super grateful to everyone that is on that tier. If you go one level up from that, I've renamed uh, the $9 tier. It's now called the buy me a beer tier. And it's funny because I don't drink very much. Uh, but I also think it's like, a, like a, it's like a fun way to not take this financial thing so seriously. It's essentially saying like, I'm providing you valuable content on a weekly basis. If our scheduling and geographical situations were different, would you take me out once a month as a thank you and buy me a beer? Yes. Yes, if the answer is yes, then that's awesome. Let's not spend it on alcohol and instead use it to make my content better. And the idea there is, of course, uh, that's 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 just to make it a little bit more fun. But then after that, there's the mentor tier, which includes that coaching call plus uh, the quarterly gearbox, and those are both at a discount. So um, also, if you're on the mentor tier and you become a part of that, I will send you a personalized video thank you message, which is kind of fun. But I'm aware $50 is a lot but it helps the most, so I want to give you that as a shout-out. Secondary update, you're probably like, Justin, where are you right now? This is my new place of residence. Anna and I just moved in here. It was very unexpectedly last minute. Uh, It was actually last week where we made the move. We were looking for an apartment on Craigslist for a friend of ours, weirdly enough. They were like, I want to get a new apartment in Seattle, and we found this spot, and we fell in love with it, and we signed the lease within like a few days of finding the posting. So yeah, we live here now. It's a little bit more space. It's removed from the downtown chaos. It's got so many windows, which we love. Um, I apologize for everyone listening over audio uh, because you don't get to see this. But for those of you that were like watching the early, early DOD episodes, the lighting was always so hard for me because it was only one window in that apartment of ours. So not only does this apartment help with that, but the kitchen is amazing, uh, as you can probably see a little bit of right here. Uh, I have a hood and a convection oven and a gas stove. I mean, gas isn't my favorite, but, you know, I'm going to do a full tour eventually. I wanted to announce it here so that I could gather some questions for you folks that I can include in the tour. So that's what I'm most excited about is, like, if you're watching this, whether it's on Instagram, uh, you need to send me a DM if you're watching on Instagram Live or if you're watching it as a video podcast and you have some questions about, you know, what I should include in the tour, um, that's what I want to know. So... This is kind of like the early tease so that the people that are watching can then leave your questions and I can answer them. I was on the hunt for a kitchen studio space for like the longest time here in Seattle, which is really hard to find so that I could shoot videos in them. But this essentially makes it so that I don't have to find a space. I don't have to commute. And then I can use those funds and that extra time to kind of bring someone in to help film, um, which is my main goal right now. I know I've been talking about DOD coming back for ages. It is coming back. I want season two to be like leaps and 
and bounds better than my original DOD videos. The core concepts will, of course, be the same, but I don't want, I want the production quality to be like jaw dropping um, and really entertaining and have a lot of really good information for you folks. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, new digs. It's almost all unpacked. There's still a little bit of chaos behind the camera here, but uh, it's very exciting. So for anyone that is like, I miss the old studio, a friend of ours actually moved into the old place. So I still technically have access if you're still itching to have one of those videos, but for the most part, all content, all photos, all videos going forward will be shot out of this spot. And I couldn't be more excited. So here's that update for you. First up in our main stories, I wasn't sure I was going to make this a main story, but I wanted to dive deeper into it because I really, really enjoyed watching it so much. Soigne Films, which is a very smart name to name your restaurant production video production company, Soigne Films put out a small mini documentary called Michelin on the Road. And I watched it and I was like, whoa, this is like better than good. This is like super good from a cinematography perspective. So I started to do some digging and Jim Sullivan is the man behind it. So his second account, Soigne Films, is a quote unquote full production company focusing on creative storytelling in the culinary and cocktail industry. And this was his first film all about Val Cantu from uh, California's, a restaurant that I've talked about before. It's in San Francisco, two Michelin stars. I had an amazing meal there. And it's essentially cataloging his trip to do a dinner at Quintonil in Mexico City. So it has a, a, a huge selection of amazing shots. I was almost taken aback by how good the shots were, and I didn't really get that much story-wise from the film. Um, and it does kind of get repetitive. It's like slow motion shot after slow motion shot after slow motion shot. Um, but I gave him a follow. His photos are amazing. You folks know how critical I am of food media, not just in their honesty and transparency, but I also have so much respect for quality and aesthetic. So Jim is very, very rock solid. I mean, look at these photos, right? Uh, they're insane. So just check out Jim Sullivan underscore on Instagram. If you're listening audio only to this, you can bring this up on your phone and take a look at his uh, photos. I've also linked him up in the show notes. You won't regret it. Dude's only got like 12,000 followers on Instagram. So I'm keeping an eye on this guy. I would love to have him on the show and talk about media production and restaurants uh, as like an interview show or even just spend a day shooting with him to like learn a thing or two because his stuff is really, really on point. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun mini documentary. You're not really going to miss that much if you don't watch it, but if you're one of the people who really likes chef's table, uh, and you really like food documentaries, it's, it's only a couple minutes long. It's not like a soup. It's like, it's not a full feature length documentary, but I was really, really impressed. And the reason I wanted to show it as a full story is because I want you to check out, uh, his stuff. I think it should be on your radar. So next up a story that made a lot of people on the internet, very, very salty. Modern farmer published a piece called quote, Chinese regulators say trout can be sold as salmon, end quote. So let's unpack that a little bit. Their reasoning behind this decision was essentially salmonid, which is a family, right? This is for everyone like me that took zoology in senior year because you knew you were going to culinary school. You have species, genus, and then family. And then in that salmonid family of fish, the article says there are nine species of Atlantic and Pacific fish that can now be technically labeled as salmon at the market. So the article is citing so many differences from species to to species. It's not like one has a sp different colored scale on the tail than the other, and that's how you tell the difference. No, these are like different animals. There's size differences and diet alterations and flesh color and fat content. And then obviously, the, the and arguably the largest difference is, quote, rainbow trout are freshwater and salmon are saltwater fish, which means they're raised, if farmed, entirely differently and have totally different environmental and health concerns. Freshwater fish is more prone to parasites. It is generally not recommended that freshwater fish is eaten raw end quote, which is a big deal, not just for everyone that's concerned about where their food comes from, but it's also like history tells us that there are a few instances where painting things with a broad brush have not been smart uh, for long-term results. Lack of specificity leads to commodity, and a few other points the article brings up are current issues with the system as a whole, right? Quote, the advocacy group Oceana ran a test and found that one in five fish samples were mislabeled worldwide end quote, which is crazy. And as far as my opinion on this, it's twofold, I, I, I think. So for the consumer, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference as people think. I mean, if we're being honest, if you work a nine to five and you're just stopping by the store on your way home, grabbing some fish for dinner for you and the family, you're probably not going to look at where your fish came from or was it, is it fresh or was it previously frozen? Or you're not going to probably ask the butcher what the fat content of that fish is like. You're going to buy whatever's cheapest and move on. I get it. 
But that's what this decision is for. It's to make it possible to sell more fish, to get more bang for your buck out of a trout, to make it more possible for the consumer to possibly pick rainbow trout over salmon in the in the fish butchery line and i totally get it and if anything i'm happier to see more fish being consumed for for sustainable farming practices it's vastly superior with regards to any impact on the environment as opposed to large-scale meat operations which we're actually going to get into later in the show but on the complete other hand my chef brain calls bullshit on the whole entire thing the fish farming industry is incredibly corrupt that's why i said sustainable farming practices because there is there are some people who are doing it right but because there are countless places that are feeding these fish things that they aren't supposed to be eating the whole process is incredibly wasteful and it leads to a sub quality product in the end it's kind of like a lose-lose all around for a lot of these uh, larger fish farms personally i look at it like wine right back in the day someone figured out that champagne carried a brand a certain brand is not just the place on a map when you say sparkling wine from champagne People's ears perked up like that got a reaction and it's not just with demand, but with the price. So then someone said, you know what? I'm going to call my sparkling wine champagne as well. I want a slice of this pie, even though I grow my grapes 200 miles from champagne. And then the champagne guys were like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not just slimy, but it's straight lying. We got to put some laws in place to prevent this. So that's where like uh, the DOC and the DOCG in Italy came from. That's in the US. It's like AVA categorization with wine growing regions and that is all to protect the products from the people from being marketed in ways that are unfair or untrue so ultimately make it so that you are indeed producing wine from Bordeaux, you can confidently put that stamp on it and charge accordingly. There are so many acres of land growing Bordeaux, so it's rare. It, it's it's not a commodity. It's there's The whole world doesn't have the same terroir as Bordeaux, so that's what makes it special. We don't have anything like that with fish farming. And at the most, you'll get the country that your fish came from, right, on the little, uh, little sign next to the fish in the case, which is such a funny thing because the ocean is like one giant body of water in its in its largest form and what, what what i mentioned earlier with the practices that some of these farms use it's not anything you want to hear about before you order the salmon from a restaurant so it's often shrouded in this mystery fish farming and i think until we get a fish farm that really strives for building brand and putting its foot down for quality until we get the you know the japanese olive fed miyazaki wagyu of fish farming we're going to continue to see this descent into mediocrity and commoditized product with with fish and frankly, it's sad, but hey, who knows? Maybe one of you folks will be the next one to do something like that. Next up, I always love reading this stuff. Bondring Lee, aka Ulterior Epicure, published a new piece on his blog. He's not really blogging that much these days, so when he does do and post something, I try my best to pay attention. This one is called Killing Meritocracy, and it starts off where he tells the story of on his Instagram story he posted a photo of a table which was lined with linen it was like a top-down photo frilly rimmed china uh, in the frame and the question that he posed on the Instagram story was quote female chef two Michelin stars where am I the kicker none of the guesses he got were correct which I thought was really interesting so I've linked up the full piece if you want to read more but the restaurant was Acarello where Suzette Gresham has been cooking for 29 years at that place So the gist of the post, the point he was actually trying to make wasn't to champion his Instagram story status. It was to reiterate a point that I made in a very controversial episode of the podcast very many, many months ago. He talks about making sure people succeed based on merit and the quality of their work and not applauded or ostracized based on the color of their skin or their gender or their sexual orientation or any of the other diverse qualities that make someone uniquely them. Bonjwang saying, quote, notice that I celebrate these women not for the qualities by which they were born and over which they had no choice. I celebrate them for what they have earned and achieved in life despite their gender. They are tremendously talented chefs and have created truly wonderful restaurants in spite of an uneven playing field. They prove that hard work and dedication and, most importantly, cooking good food win the day, end quote. Continuing to say, quote, I understand that many industry awards, lists, rankings are pushing the diversity angle in an effort to raise the tide for all boats. And while I think the intentions are generally good, I reject this trickle-down approach because it's being employed at the cost of meritocracy. That's too high a price to pay, not to mention highly insulting to the integrity of those who this recent social awakening purports to benefit. Of course, that 
uh, recent social awakening bit that he talks about is referencing the largely vocal uh, political views of almost everyone on the internet these days. And with the ease at which you can get into like a fighting match online, he covers this a little bit in the start of the article. So does he provide a concrete solution to this problem? No, I don't think anyone can. But I'm happy to see someone with a megaphone like Ulterior Epicure voicing his thoughts on the current state of affairs. You folks know I'm quick to call people out, even people I like for doing things that I don't agree with. But this is one of those instances where I continue to be a fan of Bonjwing and what he champions because, I mean, to me, it's just the truth, right? And this is my question of the day for you folks. What do you think about all this? Do you think that meritocracy should always win or do we need to take this time as a buffer to applaud and award people's diversity for equality's sake? And let me know in the comments. I'm really, really eager to hear your thoughts. So Pete Wells, a gentleman I feel like I've mentioned a lot in the past few weeks. We've covered a lot of his writing. He's clearly been hard at work. He published a piece called Why David Chang Matters, and the subtitle is Diners Who Look for His Stamp in Every Momofuku Restaurant May Be Missing His Rare Achievement as an Impresario Who Lets His Chefs Innovate. End quote. And the article begins with, quote, Without, with, with the possible exception of his mother, nobody would argue that people don't talk enough about David Chang. More often than not, though, he is talked about for the wrong things. End quote. Which Pete Wells then flips that entire script and applauds David Chang for an innumerable number of words. It is really fascinating dissection of kind of like where he is right now. It's not from like a rah-rah, glitz and glam celebrity chef perspective, but like someone who really knows the industry and has eaten at a few David Chang places, and he he really respects what David Chang is doing. So he talks about several of his 10 restaurants in three countries in cities like Toronto, Sydney, LA, New York, and more. So here are a few of my favorite lines from the article. Quote, yet everybody has an idea of what typical David Chang food is, and they all seem to agree that Major Domo in Los Angeles serves it. Given that the restaurant, which opened in January, was Mr. Chang's first in California, and given how deeply the menu is marinated in the Korean food he grew up with, it was probably inevitable that some diners would read it as a culinary autobiography. It is possible to read thousands of words of critical appraisals of Major Domo without learning that the executive chef there is named Jude Para Sickles, end quote. Which is such a fascinating thing, right? With all these restaurants that he has all over the world, David Chang is trying to, is, he is successfully taken his ego out of the food and given an immense amount of control to the professional teams that he has running each place. Well, saying, quote, menus almost never name the actual cook responsible for a dish, so we attribute everything to the boss. I've done it, particularly when it allows me to pin bad reviews on the famous owner rather than a young chef running a kitchen for the first time, end quote. Continuing on about his growth as a restaurateur, quote, we talk about the comfort and civility that has quietly slithered into his restaurants to replace the backless seats and argumentative menus of his early years. His entire career has been spent trying to calibrate precisely how much of these two qualities a good restaurant needs. Comfort has always been part of the conversation around Mr. Chang, but his evolution in that area hasn't always been noticed. The last time he tried to shortchange us on comfort was with Momofuku Nishi, which hopefully you remembered we covered on the podcast a couple months ago, in Manhattan a couple of years ago, but by which time it was a recidivist throwback to his days as a noodle-slinging punk. Nearly every critic in town called him on it, and he reworked the space. But he has always recognized that the fabric swaddle dining rooms that once signified comfort gave a lot of younger people the sensation of being buried alive, end quote. Which is fascinating, right? Because it's so true. It's almost cool to be uncomfortable in a restaurant and like have a chair that's not really that cozy and to have a countertop that's kind of like bent to one side right or use mismatched uh silverware which was not the case uh 15 years ago but there's this fascinating line to draw between hospitably thoughtful and over luxification and 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 grandeur right and overall it's a really really to me this article is a really great snapshot of where david chang is at his career right now i know i cited uh, a couple weeks ago, I cited Nobu as the only chef I could think of that has such a globally recognized restaurant brand in like the higher echelons of food. But after reading this article and the startling statistic that David Chang has 10 restaurants, right? Like when did that happen? I was like taken aback by that number. I got to say that David Chang fills that void pretty well, if I had to say so myself. But all these points we were talking about with Robuchon, right? Like you eat at a place, you fly halfway across the world and compare both meals at both restaurants. You can do that with Momofuku restaurants. And it's even more exciting because the change isn't going to be like, oh, 
this pork bun has pork from Australia and this pork bun has American pork. It's not like those tiny minute details. It's like LA's vibe was like this and the menu had that. And then we went to Toronto and it was some Colombian chef cooking beef over fire and it was amazing. And you can have these really great experiences without like copying and pasting the menu from one space to another. And I think a lot of us are going to look back and see David Chang as one of the legends, I think, of our generation. And back to that piece about meritocracy, I think that like the fact that he's not a French white dude either, he's ex he's executing on an insanely inspiring level. And I'm really, really happy to see it unfolding. So next up, an article I actually read in a paper magazine first. And then I was like, why didn't I see this online? GQ's Marion Bull published an article called, quote, how do we fix toxic restaurant culture, end quote. And it's not your typical article, right? They brought six industry folks together to sit down and talk it out from Amanda Cohen to Tom Colicchio to Gerardo Gonzalez and Michael Solomonov. It's fascinating as a read. And if you have any interest in this topic, sexual abuse, managing uh, restaurant culture and dynamics, I really, really highly recommend it. It's, I would love to read it all to you aloud, but I would like constantly be having to either change my voices or say, and then Colicchio says, and then Cohen says, and that would get a little repetitive. So I'm going to break down a couple of quotes, and I'm going to leave the article linked up below. They do a much better job of like being able to read it like a like a script. So there are a few quotes I want to touch on because I think they're really important. Cohen says, quote, I have an employee right now who is like, I need to go to a Michelin-starred restaurant, Amanda. I need a lot more motivation. I need to be yelled at. End quote. And this isn't the first time I'm hearing about this. I've had conversations with a couple of you folks even about you wanting to be pushed. You want to beat yourself down so you can come out on the other side as one of these like quote unquote tough chefs. But the reality of it is the kitchens where those skills of yelling and belittling and abusing people are becoming few and far between and they're even going to get smaller as the next generation gets trained in them, right? So it's okay to go to your manager and say, I want to be challenged. I want to push myself beyond what I think I'm currently capable of and then work through possible solutions with these people that are supposed to be doing that for you. But to have the audacity to think that getting yelled at is a prerequisite for being a good chef is just silly, right? Where does that get you? That's my question to you. If, if, if it gives you the, if anything, it gives you the empathy to see why to not do that to people, right? To be able to say, I'm not going to be that kind of chef. I've been yelled at and I know what that feels like and that's not what I want uh, in my team. And I get it. If you have shit with your family or your self-esteem and you need that kind of force to move yourself in a direction, that's something that you need to deal with like for yourself, right? You should not go seek out those environments because for the 10 people that get yelled at from a screaming chef, nine of them get depressed and angry and resentful and then they pass it along to other people in their lives or the next generation of staff in the restaurant. And then of those 10 people, there's the one who really, really gets motivated and it pushes them past their limits and they come out on the other side, not taking the abuse personally, but as a catalyst for their growth. That's literally the definition of what a catalyst is. It's something that doesn't really matter once the reaction is over. It's just there to facilitate the reaction. But my point with all of this is that I think we're going to see a new chapter where the yelling and the screaming and the abuse are not applauded, but being savvy and being consistent and being fit and mentally sound and having the strength to grow other people and share your ideas, these are going to be the things that are looked at as quote unquote cool as opposed to the last generation's like dusty award shelf, if that makes sense. I think of it like this, right? Your grandfather tells you stories of his time in the army, right? Like we used to get beat up and there was no showers and I was always covered in mud and I'd run uphill both ways and we'd sleep outside and we'd ration our food. You know the stories, right? Like you've heard stories like this. You can take that information and be like, damn, I want to be tough like that. All right, tomorrow I'm going to start rationing my food and find the nearest double hill rock formation so I can run up both ways and I'm going to, you know, work hard and, you know, stop showering, which, spoiler alert, is really, really stupid. Or you could be like, I got to be resourceful. I got to be grateful for what I have. I got to work hard and train and have a thick skin and then like take a like look around yourself and find modern ways to make that happen, right? 
There are so many tools. All the people that you look up to probably are putting their stuff out as a podcast episode or someone's following them around and filming them or they've written a book that you can read about it. It's not the way that it used to be before. And I want to like hammer that hard because I I just think it's going to take you down a path that you don't want to go down. And you can find people like that. Uh, that will push you. And if you find a place that is gives you the, the, the motivation to be a part of something that is bigger than you and to have someone believe in growing you and motivate you to do things that you'd otherwise not want to do, that's what you want. And there are plenty of people out there that can help you with that um, without the potentially long-term harmful effects of what happened to the generation before us. So that's my small rant on this topic, but I want to leave you with a quick back and forth uh, between Gerardo Gonzalez and Jen Egg. Gonzalez says, right, I mean, it's tricky. I would say from my experience running places that you can get very kumbaya. And the problem is at the end of the day, your employees actually want some kind of structure. They thrive off of it. When they don't have the structure, they feel like you don't have the tools to actually achieve something or succeed. And Jen Ag says, cooks need to learn how to be leaders, not angry parents. Gonzalez says, they need to learn how to communicate, honestly. As a cook, I learned to repress things. Personally, I don't believe my cooks have have to leave their baggage at the door. If you're carrying something with you, we can talk about it. Giving someone a fucking hug is good enough to get them through the day so they're not like eating their own stress, end quote. So that's where I'm going to leave it. I don't know if you folks have any uh, chat on that. Uh, if you want to leave it in the comments, I'm happy to get into that later on. So last up, a topic that I've recently switched views on. Vox put out a piece called Lab Grown Meat and the Fight Over What It Can Be Called Explained, end quote. So a little background from me on this topic. The last time that I personally did any real research into lab-grown meat was like, we're cloning cows and we're doing petri dish tests and it kind of tastes like the mixture between a sponge and a grilled sewer animal, right? And I kind of had a really negative lens through which I viewed lab-grown protein. And that all changed when I listened to a podcast Tim Ferriss did with this guy named Steve Jervetson. And it was really, really insane to listen to. It was essentially talking about how the technology is going to get so good that we aren't even going to be able to taste the difference. And it's going to be so sustainable and so much less wasteful. And it's going to provide solutions to feeding millions of people. And it's going to be looked at, we're going to look back at it and re, like look at it as this really archaic thing. And we're going to say like, can you believe we used to raise animals on these massive farms and keep them in tiny cages and butcher them and then freeze half the meat because people don't want to eat it quite yet, and then grind the bones for dog food, and then we're going to throw so much away, right? It's going to be like the conversation that kind of shut off uh, so many of my arguments, because as a chef, you want to make sure you're getting really high quality stuff, but at what cost, right? Like, it's better to say, here, I'm serving you this incredibly rich and fatty, dry-aged piece of meat. We only have a 6% waste on it. It was grown down the street. It's fresh. We never freeze it. And we worked with the lab to give it these really olive characteristics so that we can pair it with this dish, which is like capers and potato and spinach, right? As opposed to what well, many high-end restaurants are doing right now, where they will say, you know, I fly in only the cap on ribeye from Japan because I want to say I use A5 on my menu and I don't really know what happens with the rest of the cow and we use the Wagyu fat for our pasta sauce for staff meal, right? Like, we all know places like that. And it's such a night and day difference to me, but it's, it's weird to talk about because it's such a foreign thing for so many of us. So let's get into this article and learn more. Vox says, quote, lab-grown meat cultured meat, cell-based meat, clean meat, it's all the same thing. Meat grown from just a few cells from an actual animal. And although it's years away from your supermarket, it's potentially a radical change in animal agriculture as we know it, and it's stirring up tensions. As a tip of the hat to our previous article about the trout, uh, quote, at the urging of traditional meat producers, Missouri passed a law in May prohibiting anything, quote, not derived from harvest harvested production livestock or poultry, end quote, from being marketed as quote unquote meat in the store, which is crazy, right? So you can call a trout a salmon, but you can't call a product grown from the same originating cell of the species meat. Just let that process in your head for a second. All right, so let's just keep going. Let's talk about how they get this product in the first place. So lab-grown meat starts with cells. You can use stem cells, muscle cells, fat cells, and you submerge that in a growth medium. The medium is a quote-unquote soup of nutrients that mimics what happens in the animal's body. 
end quote. Uh, he talks a little bit about that. And depending on the type of cells and the medium ingredients, you can grow different kinds of tissue. Muscle cells grow more muscle cells. Fat cells grow more fat cells. Both are in meat as we know it. Stem cells can be coaxed into growing different kinds of tissue. So that's where you kind of get some room, a wiggle room to play with. And apparently after that, they have to deal with a few other issues, which is like how to create certain textures and fibers in the meat that are normally the result of an animal's either exercise or the plain effect of gravity on a muscle, which is really interesting. But the ultimate question, of course, how does it taste? Quote, lab-grown meat makers claim their products will taste exactly like the real thing because they are the real thing. That leaves consumers to make their decision on factors other than taste, and lab-grown meat definitely has its advantages. Some are obvious, like the animal welfare issue. Take the animal out of the equation and the welfare problems go with it. No more slaughterhouses, no more caging, crating, crowding animals, no more rare cases of outright abuse, end quote. So the article continues to talk about the economy, how large-scale livestock farming taking that down a notch would have profound effects on the environment. There's so much water waste and electricity that goes into producing meat in that way. Uh, They asked the question, how does leather get produced if we take, uh, you know, animals out of the equation? Uh, They cover foodborne illnesses and so much more. It's such a fascinating topic that, again, I think will be something that we tell our kids about when we take them out to eat for dinner and we tell them how we used to get meat from a living animal by killing the whole thing and then eating whatever cut we, we were interested in and we're going to be a tiny bit embarrassed about it. And the major pushback in this case I see comes from the people that are profiting off of the current ecosystem. And that's definitely going to be a blow to those people who make their livelihoods off of producing these products. But regardless of the cost, I'm stoked to try lab-grown meat for the first time. Some of you might remember seeing the cooking with insects video I made a few weeks ago. I've I'm absolutely interested in working with alternative sources of protein. Um, So I can't wait to see what the future brings. What are your thoughts, though? Are you 100% anti-cell-based meat? Are you chomping at the bit to get this technology advanced enough so it takes care of a lot of these ethical issues? Where is your head at? Let me know in the comments or tweet at me. I would love to continue the conversation. Last up in industry style news, we have direct answer. That's where you folks send me a DM. And with your permission, I like to answer it in a way that might help the collective. So normally I'm all about giving a shout out to whoever submitted the question, but this one was actually someone who wanted to remain confidential. So I'm going to pose the question here. Quote, big fan of what you're doing. I've been working in New York City at a pretty high-end restaurant. I'm in a similar scenario that you were in when you worked at Grace. The restaurant is pulling some shady things. I'm probably working close to 60-hour weeks, and I'm only getting paid around 45 of those hours. It's also not just me, but all the other cooks are getting their hours cut after we had already worked them. I honestly don't know what to do. It's frustrating and depressing. I I haven't really talked to my family or close friends about this because I'm embarrassed and ashamed. I also feel disconnected with some of the other cooks because there's a language language slash cultural barrier. So the question then becomes like, where do I take it from here? Um, first of all, good on this person for reaching out because it's it's very easy to let it just kind of fester and bother you, especially if like you feel like your moral standards are not in line with the people that you work for. That's really, really, it takes a lot of courage to reach out like that. And I'm, I'm happy that I can be a resource if, if that turns into something for you. Um, but my my biggest thing that I try to convey is that a lot of what's happening is out of your control, right? You are an employee and you choose to work for this restaurant and you sign a contract that basically says like, this is what I agree to do for, you know, X, Y, Z number of hours at this rate. Sometimes you don't even have a contract, right? Like I've worked at places where the contract just doesn't exist. You Here's when you start, uh, show up at this time, right? So... If you have a contract, if you sign any sort of document with whatever HR department they have at the restaurant, you need to ask for that contract and ask to sit down with your management and review that contract, right? And what the 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 best way you can go about it is to provide some like non-negotiable objective parameters, right? Not um You know, I don't feel like I'm being treated fairly, which is all very valid stuff, right? But if you really want to come out of it on the winning side, it needs to be, listen, man, my contract says I'm working 50 hours a week at this rate and I'm going to get paid overtime, which... Also, if you aren't in this situation, I hope is a lesson to you that, you know, you should look for these things in a contract when you're signing one is like, are you respecting my time and are you 
like is your is my hourly rate being confidently given to me in exchange for my time so if you can have that conversation with your management of like this is what my contract says and this is what my pay stub says right so you notice i have like two documents i'm not saying like hey last week was kind of busy uh i work 60 hours as opposed to what my contract says which is normally 40 um what's up with that because they're gonna like they're just going to bat you out of the room. Like you need to have some solid proof of like, this is what my contract says. This is what my pay stub says. That's number one. Number two, I would, so this is coming from personal experience. When it was happening at Grace, we kind of banded together as a group of line cooks and we started to talk it out and we started to think to ourselves, what are our options as a collective? And I know you mentioned that there was like some language barriers and um, I think another email says, uh, I feel like they think I'm stupid because I don't understand the language, which is also really unfortunate, right? But if you can come forward and say, you know, I want to get this fixed for all of us, this is my proposition, and it doesn't, I mean, you, you, you if, if, if no one else is doing it, you got to kind of take the lead on it. Um, I was fortunate that I was like the youngest person in the kitchen at Grace, so I was just kind of like... I don't know what's going on. My last job, I was working for free, so I'm happy to get a paycheck, but I know this is, is shady and stupid. Um, so yeah, my, my, my advice would, would be see what kind of hard evidence you can have and then bring it forward as like, I don't feel like this is right. And then plan B is, of course, to see how you as a collective can come forward to the management um, because if you do it any other way, I fear that you're going to kind of get swatted to the side, especially if the management is very aware that this is happening. And one thing that happened with us was we came to the management at Grace as a collective and we were like, hey, what's going on? We're not getting paid any overtime. This is kind of weird. And Curtis told all of us to our faces that he had no idea that we were getting paid, that we were not getting paid, which I thought was like really weird me as a young chef, I was like, you're the owner of this business and you don't know about your staff salary. Like that seems kind of bizarre to me. Um, but who knows, maybe that was the real case and maybe that was what's actually was happening. And maybe your management is just ignorant of the fact that, you know, they outsource their payroll to somebody else. And had you not come to them with these documents that say, Hey, these numbers don't match up, then they can fix it. But, um, Again, I don't know if it's something that's known and really happening, but I also know that there's a ton of corruption as far as like work hours and being able to afford people at the highest end of, of restaurant. So, um, I mean, your alternative is if you're already working at this place and you feel confident in your cooking skills, there are plenty of other restaurants in New York City. Yeah, you're in New York that would probably be super happy to have you. And if you're not getting what you want at this restaurant, you need to move on. Um, and that's the last, kind of like the last straw. It can be your first straw. You can be like, I don't want to deal with this. This is, I don't, I don't want to work with people who are ignorant to the fact that their staff is not getting paid. And that's the last straw for you. And you just move on. Or you can go through those steps of like, provide the documentation, come together as a team, talk to the management. And then after all of that, if, if it changes, amazing. If not, it's time to move on. So that was direct answer. I really, really hope you enjoyed it. If you did and wish there was a way to not only get your questions answered, but also have a dialogue, uh, not just a little one-off back and forth, I offer coaching sessions. There's two ways to schedule one. If you're getting ready to make your next move, you got to update your resume, practice answering interview questions. You can check out justinconnacom slash coaching. And as a thank you for listening this far into the show, use code end of the show, all one word, and get a sweet, sweet discount off your first coaching session. Say you're starting culinary school. You're now navigating what that looks like. You're on track to become a sous chef and you know the next six months are going to be crazy. My highest tier on Patreon is called the mentor tier. And with that comes monthly coaching sessions. They're 30 minutes once a month to kind of check in on your progress. And they're designed to be a longer lasting relationship between you and me. And we set up goals that are unique to your ambitions. And I keep a little document on my laptop. That's all your progress and what your goals are for the next month and the good and the bad. So we just make sure you're doing the right things uh, to progress your career. So that is available on patreon.com slash Justin Kana. And that also supports all the content that's happening. In our non-industry story of the week, I want to give a little shout out to a new thing that I'm starting every single month. It's called the $100 Experiment. I don't know why. I, I mean, I wasn't really that creative with that uh, name, but I'm still deciding if I want to document it and share it in any way. This is the first time I'm really sharing that I'm doing it. Um, 
it's just, I think here sharing my genuine thoughts is a good start. So maybe I'll do a Twitter thread or make an Instagram style story and then turn it into a highlight reel. I'm not really sure how it pans out, but what they are is are selfish experiments for me. Um, and I'm giving myself a budget of hundred dollars a month to, you know, instead of going out to dinner or buying a new pair of pants, I want to do something that improves my life, whether it's my mental health or my physical capacity or strengthen my relationships or sleep or nutrition speed at which I do my job. Um, and the first one that I did last month that's over now is the nine t-shirt experiment. So you see at the start of the year, Anna and I decided that with each other, we were not going to buy clothes in 2018. And it was amazing, right? Like we stopped going shopping when we were like, uh, bored and only to buy useless things that we would never end up wearing. So we both downsized our closets quite a bit since the start of the year. And it was maybe in like May or June, we were like, this is kind of ridiculous. Like we're really getting rid of our stuff. And what happens when you don't go clothes shopping for six months is you realize that you're essentially wearing the same things and you keep reaching for your favorite t-shirt or your favorite jeans. So I was introduced to this like uniform policy by Matt Diavella, this guy that I recently started supporting on Patreon. He just launched a Patreon. I love his podcast, The Ground Up Show, so I'm proud to support him. But he talks about, he's like a minimalist, and he says he has this favorite t-shirt, so why not buy like hella of that shirt, right? So you can wear that, your favorite shirt every single day. So that's what I've done. And this is one of them where I'm wearing one right now. This is from Uniqlo. It's one of their Supima cotton tees. They're like $9.90 a piece. They wash great. They feel great. So I bought nine of them. There are three of this color, three navy ones, and like three of a charcoal grayish color. And that's all I've been wearing for the past month or so. And I seriously got rid of all my other shirts, especially uh, when we made this move into this new apartment. Uh, it was really liberating to be able to pack my closet up so fast because there's not much left anymore. Uh, so that's what it kind of turned into. It started as 2018, we're not buying any clothes to, you know, if we're going to buy clothes, I feel like we should, if I'm going to buy one t-shirt, I need to get rid of two. And then it just constantly like trims down your closet smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so... This month's experiment is going to be all about diet. I have recently downloaded Kevin Rose's Zero app. It is a fasting tracking app. So I'm testing how 16-hour intermittent fasting affects me and how it affects my lifestyle. So I'm switching my day around. So I'll be working out in the mornings in a fasted state because I've heard really, really good things about how that happens. And I have in the mail Bulletproof's Brain Octane Oil, which is a, uh, it's almost like a modified MCT oil which I'm really, really eager to try. I'm not really trying to go into ketosis for anyone that's interested about that. I just want to kind of test the waters and see how I respond with supplements because the only thing that I consume outside of like normal food is coffee. Uh, I'm a pretty straight shooter. And so with this brain octane oil, it's 16 ounces for like 25 bucks. So that gives me an extra $75 uh, next month or this month to play with. So I don't think I'll always be including my experiments and my results in this podcast, but hey, it's my show so I can do whatever I want. And if you really enjoy it, if you want to hear more about this, uh, I'd really be curious to hear your thoughts. And I would love to include this in the show if you want. If you're into kind of self-experimentation and growing self-improvement, um, maybe I'll make it on Twitter or Instagram, but yeah, we'll see what happens. So that'll do it for this week's show, episode 78, as per usual. If you have stories and you want them covered next week, shoot them to me on Twitter, hashtag the emulsion so I can find them. Let's take a quick peek at Instagram. Thanks for listening to the Emulsion Podcast. I appreciate your ears more than you know. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help sponsor the show, head on over to patreon.com slash justincana. Other ways you can help out right now include giving this show a review on iTunes so more people can find it. I also love seeing you folks liking and commenting on the video if you listen that way, or even just share this episode with a friend. Now is normally why I would tell you that my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one, but you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to, so I'm just going to get out of the out of the way here excuse excuse me